Hey guys, this is Garrett Wong, also known as Ensign Harry Kim from Star Trek Voyager, and you're watching Astronomy Live. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hey gang, welcome to Astronomy Live. It's, uh, I guess worth pointing out that I believe today is the four year anniversary of the launch you just saw. I was there at the NASA social for that launch and got to see that rocket uh, launch up close. That was the first Falcon 9 to successfully land on the drone ship. So a little bit of uh, history on this year, this uh, day four years ago. Tonight we're going to be looking at Comet Atlas once again, or what remains of it. So I'm just finishing the setup process here, focusing on a star, and now I'm going to train the auto guider uh, and the adaptive optics unit, and then we will start moving over towards the comet. All right, enjoy. So, no, the intro is, is not exactly new. That's uh, an intro I've had for a while now. At some point, I actually should probably update it, but uh, people seem to like it, so it can stay for now, as it is. So I've got the drives calibrated. Now I need to find a good focus star that's near the comet. Once again, we are going to C2019Y4 Atlas. Reports are it's in the process of disintegration. I saw a second astronomical telegram seeming to confirm 
the first astronomical telegram, uh, further corroborating the report that it is in the process of disintegrating. And we know from the, le the webcast last night, it sure does look like it's lost its nucleus and is now just a pseudo-nucleus with a general bright region. I had some interesting comments on the uh, previous webcast after the fact, uh, including one suggesting I sh should use shorter exposures. There is a little bit of motion blur to the comet from a two-minute picture, but not that much. Uh, it works out to about four pixels or so per frame. The elongation we saw was a lot more than four pixels. Um, and I'm willing to take a little bit of motion blur in exchange for greater sensitivity of the tail and really pick up the outer fringes. If you saw the thumbnail for this video, the preview picture is the stacked image from last night's webcast. So that's what it looked like after stacking and basically boosting the heck out of the levels to bring out the comet because the comet is quite dim. Uh, the stacked image makes it look bright, but as you saw during the live stream, you could barely see it, really. So we'll see what, what the situation is tonight, if it's continuing to dim or not. So first, I'm going to go to HR2209 uh, in the constellation Camelopardalis, um, which should allow me to focus, refocus the telescope near the target to compensate for any mirror flop from the slew. So stand by, I'm going to now move the telescope and refocus. For the first time in a while, um, I've got the camera oriented orthogonal, more or less, roughly orthogonal to the uh, eclip or uh, not ecliptic, the equatorial grid, which is the coordinate system the telescope is aligned in. Because, as it turns out, the star we want to see, or the the comet we want to see, has a guide star near it that is uh, well positioned if the camera is just orthogonal to the equatorial grid. Uh, it works out best that way for the guide star. Usually I have to turn it some crazy angle, but tonight we're orthogonal. The uh, AO, the Adaptive Optics Unit System mirror, does invert the image vertically. Um, but other than that, it's, it's at least roughly orthogonal to the equatorial grid. accidentally leaving my focusing mask sitting on top of my Pelican case. This time I didn't know it was on there because it's black on black. And when I opened up the case, I launched the focusing mask down the driveway. Uh, and it landed edge edgewise and started rolling to run after it. I keep forgetting to put it back in its case when I'm done with it. Okay, let's see what we got here. Hopefully the star's bright enough. Yeah, the diffraction spikes on it aren't huge, but serviceable. So now we're going to go to one by one binning. Let's zoom in and enhance. See what we get for those diffraction spikes. Yeah, we got to refocus a little bit. I'm going to see if I can... If I crank up the exposure, maybe go up to five seconds, maybe get a little more brightness on those spikes so I can really see what I'm doing. Oh, that's much better. Okay. It really doesn't need much, does it? It's it's pretty close. Uh, if anything, it's 
You know what? I think I leave well enough alone here. That's... I'm saying that's in focus. That's pretty symmetrical. Right, gang? What do you think? Pretty symmetrical? Let's go ahead and move on to the comet. Okay, I tried to position things where the guide star would easily be within the guide star imager, but trying to land a slew on within the guide star can be pretty tricky sometimes. Uh, let's take a guide star picture. Oh, beautiful, we've got it. Okay, so there's our guide star. Now I'm just going to position that close to the bottom and center in the guider. Hey, that's not bad for slew accuracy. <laughs> Putting a Putting a star within the guiding, guiding chip, it's this tiny little chip in the uh, camera. Not like the main imaging chip, which is nice and big, so there's some, some room for error with uh, moving the telescope. With the um, auto guide chip, there's really no room for error. So I'm going to center this, get it roughly centered left to right, and then down at the very bottom of the chip. That will put the comet in the best possible place. It's not going to be in the center of the image, but um, this is the best guide star available around the comet right now. So that dictates where the comet ends up in the image, just how far I can move the um, the guide star while keep keeping it just barely in the view of the auto guider. So. In the meantime, there's been other developments with the comet on YouTube, at least. Other people making videos about it. People claiming it's not disintegrating, that anyone saying it's disintegrating is lying, anyone producing evidence of that is, is faking it, etc., etc. I didn't think it was going to go to that level so fast. It's like, oh, what's that meme picture from uh, Ron Burgundy? That, that escalated quickly. Oh, it certainly did today, apparently. I just had a comment in the chat before the live before this live stream started with somebody claiming that Igor Kostelak produced evidence that it hadn't disintegrated. It's all a false narrative. Well, I guess I'm part of that false narrative since I was showing it last night. It was clearly not a healthy comet. Uh, I only briefly looked at the link to uh, Igor's video. Yes, Igor, as in like... I thought it was pronounced Igor. No, it's pronounced Igor. Anyway. Um, I took a quick look at his video, and it looked like sort of a just a wide-angle shot of some stars at sunset or the evening. I didn't see conclusive proof of the comet. I didn't see what looked like Comet Atlas anywhere in the video. I just glanced at it. So I don't know what that's all about, but... Uh, you guys are going to get to see what's left of the comet tonight, hopefully. Alright, we can guide at a faster speed than that, can't we? Yes, we can. This thing's really bright, so we can go to point... Let's do point oh eight. Let's see what we get there. That's better. 8 hertz on the guiding. That's pretty good. We can start saving these images now. We're not going to use subframe, we're going to use full frame, main image or chip, two minute exposures with auto dark. 
and away we go. All right, so we're off and running now, imaging the comet. I'm not going to do nearly as long a webcast tonight. Uh, I've got to catch up on my sleep at some point, so do an hour or two at most tonight. So for those wondering, the comet is still in the constellation Camelopardalis, same as the focusing star that we just took an image of up here. Um, for those who are wondering, the diffraction spikes coming off the star are produced by a focusing mask that I lay over the telescope to ensure good focus. I have to make sure that the horizontal diffraction spike is symmetrical in the vertical axis uh, relative to the X-shaped diffraction spikes running through the star. Uh, that's how I verify it's in good focus. So it's a focusing tool to make sure the telescope is perfectly in focus. Otherwise you have to just kind of judge it by eye. Is the star getting smaller? Is the star getting bigger? And it can be tricky to do, especially when the atmospheric seeing and turbulence is possibly distorting the star. You can't tell if you're really making things better or worse when you get close to focus. So a focusing mask is a very powerful tool for helping you quickly and accurately get good focus on your telescope. So this is a Batonov style focusing mask. All right, 20 seconds till our first picture of Comet Atlas comes in. Let me just verify that we are saving these images. Yes, okay. Still a little tired from last night, so I've been hitting the coffee hard today. I wanna make sure I don't forget any steps. Hey, Sam, good to see you. All right, here we go. Here we go, here we go. Oh yeah, there it is. that like that until we get the dark frame in. I want to see the whole situation when the when the um, auto dark completes. But there's your comet, or what's left of it, right there. Looking very similar to last night, really. You notice there's no really central star-like point of light that is in the comet showing uh, a, um, a nucleus, really. You, the the pseudo-nucleus is elongated and uh, diffuse, very diffuse. So that's a sign that the comet is in the process of disintegrating. Professional observatories have reported some fragmentation or, or what looks like a bimodal distribution of brightness in the pseudo-nucleus. So that seems to be fancy speak for it's breaking up. But not to worry, because its orbit does not carry it close to Earth. Uh, its orbit does not even carry it close to Earth's orbit. The minimum orbit intersect distance is more than 0.6 astronomical units, or more than half the distance to the Sun, almost two-thirds of the distance to the Sun. The closest approach distance is about 0.78 astronomical units, or more than three-quarters the distance to the Sun. So the breakup velocities, the, the velocities involved with this comet breaking up are not so high as to allow it to send debris to Earth. And later, hopefully this weekend, I will do a video focusing on that and um, demonstrating that. Alright. Good. Everything looks good with the auto dark. So, there is like a little point there in the nucleus. That is interesting. A slightly brighter point there. The moon's coming up a little later tonight, so we have better sky conditions right now than we had through most of last night.
trying to see if well, the comet's where where it looks to be in Sky Safari Pro. <sighs> Mosquitoes. I also watched ISS Transit tonight. Uh, well, not transit the moon or anything, but just fly overhead tonight. Would have tracked it with the telescope, but it was configured for comet viewing, so not really compatible with uh, high-quality ISS tracking. When it's on the wedge for polar alignment, it's shakier from its own motors. It uh, suffers more vibrations, so it's not conducive to high-speed tracking of satellites like ISS. So it was a one or the other situation, and, you know, sadly, I, I can see ISS later on. That'll still be around, but the Comet, not so much necessarily. So given the choice, I chose to go after the Comet. And I think people here watching the stream have been enjoying it. I'm sure I see a lot of regulars here in the chat. What? Space.com just ran a story about how great the comet was going to be? That's an oof. <laughs> I'm guessing they wrote that story up before this news broke, and they just ran with it anyway for some reason? Okay, so that that's interesting. That bright point that was there is not there now. And you can see how very long the comet streak appears. Now, to some extent, that's going to be motion blurring, but... That's only four pixels worth, and that's more than four pixels right there. This is going from about 691, 337 to about uh, 671, 338. So that's about 20 pixels long, at least. And the comet's own motion is only accounting for, you know, about a fifth of that. So there's more going on here than just the comet's moving and camera's fixed on the stars. It is fixed on the stars, but it's been that way through my previous webcasts, even before last night. And if anyone wants, go check it out. Go check out my previous webcasts. You'll see a dramatic difference in the morphology and brightness of the comet. And right now, like I said, the moon is just coming up. It's not high enough in the sky yet to be much of a factor, and yet the comet still looks quite pathetic. So, yeah, this uh, this is what a not healthy comet looks like. That's space.com for you. Uh, yeah, I uh, I know those guys try hard, but sometimes they're a little sensationalist, I guess, and not entirely accurate. Ouch. I'm not trying to be harsh, but yeah, I, that's not the first time I've seen a slip-up like that come from them. I, I used to rely pretty heavily on them for reporting on space events, and I really don't as much as I used to, to be honest. Uh, I hardly ever go to space.com anymore. But that's just me. Oh, thanks, Scott Mayer, for posting the link in the chat there. I gotta check this out. I haven't had time to check this out. Well, at least this is two days ago. Okay. I'll, I'll give them that the article itself was written a couple days ago. But I see what you're saying. They, they promoted it on Facebook today. Like, here, still read this story. Because, you know, we we spent a lot of time putting it together. It's it's obsolete information at this point. It's out of date. But, you know, <laughs> we paid our staff good money to write this article. So please watch it. Please, please watch our ads and read the article, even though it's no longer valid. <laughs> uh what is this Nibiru people are referring to? Oh, man, that's a... I hate to say it, but it's a, it's an old conspiracy theory that still gets dug out of the closet every time there's a bright comet claiming that a 
massive planet is going to swing through the solar system every 3,600 years. Planet or even a brown dwarf, really massive object that's going to perturb the orbits of the planets, send debris and rocks at Earth and cause devastation, earthquakes, volcanoes, you name it. And uh, every single time there's a comet that gets popular attention, they say there's a there's a fraction of people here on YouTube who will say that the comet is not a comet, it is actually Planet X, Nibiru, whatever they want to call it. So, the Silly Shills show, it's a tongue twister, on the EIE network on uh, YouTube will be doing a show next week. Uh, they've invited myself and Red's Rhetoric on to talk about some of these videos that are calling this comet Nibiru and other silly things. So we'll have a discussion about that sometime next week. Yeah, I feel the same exact way, Sam. They used to be better, I feel like. Uh, maybe I've just gotten older and wiser, or maybe they their quality's deteriorated, but my honest opinion, yeah, space.com is not what it used to be. You want a gigabyte USB drive? That's cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That The Nibiru people came for a visit. Well, it, I don't want to assume that, that you know, the person bringing me that information was necessarily bought into that cult fully, but maybe convinced by their arguments, not necessarily that they themselves are one of the major proponents. The person they were talking about, Igor Kostelak, is uh, one of the major Nibiru people here on YouTube, and so he's now starting to do live streams of what he claims is the comet, but from what I've seen of his images, uh, I, d I don't like to be harsh, but I haven't seen the comet in his images, let me put it like that. You can see the comet here pretty clearly. This is definitely not just a regular star or planet that I'm pointing at here. This is a diffuse, fuzzy object, or what's left of one. Is that show going to include your own calculated coordinates of Asteroid 1998 OR2, or did you do that on this show already? I haven't done the calculations on it yet. Uh, uh, Jensen, I am going to be doing that. Um, I might run over and grab some more astrometry on the asteroid tonight, but I wanted to prioritize prioritize the comet um, while the moon is down, or at least low, and uh, the sky conditions are good. And I honestly, I might not, I might not do astrometry of the asteroid tonight. We'll see if I feel like it. Tell you what, we'll, we'll throw it on a dice throw here. If I don't have to reorient the camera and I can just swing over there at some point and grab it, then I'll grab it. If I can't, if I'd have to reorient the camera, I'm not going to bother because then I have to recalibrate the auto guider and all that other stuff. It's just time, 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 time. So, is there a suitable guide star that would not require me reorienting the camera? Actually, yes, there is. Yes, there is. There's a nice magnitude 7.5 guide star that I could get on real easy with. OR2. So I'll swing over there and do that at the end of the webcast. That will be the plan. I just like the question to Sam there from Observer. Was the drive empty or full of garbage? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, man. That's the other thing with their site. They... They really went hard with the uh, ads and pop-ups on their site lately, it seems. Which just 
you know, psychologically it has the effect of making me not want to click the link right off the bat. I don't care what the information is on the page. So yeah, the comet is scooting along here in each of the images. But it really does not look like a productive, healthy comet. And it will gradually move to the right and a little bit up as it travels according to SkySpark Pro. Gotta pay the bills somehow. Yeah, yeah. And I get that, but... You know, if they had really high quality information, I feel like they could do it a different way. They could do paid memberships or something, kind of like the L2 section at uh, NASA Space Flight. Something like that. You know, those guys provide really good quality information and, and kind of inside intel and if you want the high quality stuff you got to pay for a membership but it's worth the money so you know that's the other way of approaching that problem but if you can't bring the quality then you got to bring the quantity Anyway, that's just me. That's my honest opinion. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, I, I agree. Other sites have ads and don't have them popping up all over the content. I mean, I, maybe I'm spending too much time on opining on the quality of various websites, but you know, maybe that's because those sites bring in enough revenue just from normal traffic. They really don't have to pump it full of ads to get the revenue they need. Whereas Space.com, I, I feel like they're, you know, really struggling. And that's just my... That's just my outside impression from looking at it. It appears Comet Atlas has the the disease. I'm not going to say that because it'll get me demonetized, but... Uh, yeah, it's not looking too healthy as comets go. Do comets frequently appear without being spotted like this one did? Yeah, I mean, long period comets, they never give you a huge amount of warning um, unless they're going to be extremely bright and start brightening very early and deep in the solar system. Um, they do come out of nowhere. That's uh, they, they come from the Oort cloud, they spend a long time traveling here, and they don't really, they aren't really discovered until they reach close, a point close enough to the sun that they start heating up and outgassing their... Um, the volatiles that start to, uh, volatiles that have a sublimation point that's uh, sublimates at the coldest possible temperatures. As it gets closer and closer to the sun, more of the material will start sublimating. Eventually, water ice, and that's where really good comets really kick in and start looking pretty. Uh, but this is not one of those, it seems. Now, this comet is related to the Great Comet of 1844, which did put on a very good show in the 19th century. Uh, and the orbit, as I mentioned previously, is extremely, extremely similar. They look identical. Um, if you look at the elements of that comet from 1844 to the elements of this comet right now, they look practically identical. And they really, in 
from what I've seen, from my analysis, it looks like they really shouldn't unless they had a common origin relatively recently in their history. Because as they come through the solar system, the planets are going to be in different positions in 1844 versus 2020. And they will experience different perturbations as a result of that. Not to mention their own outgassing, which will be variable. They'll have jets going in various directions of material, which can push the comet this way or that a little bit. And so over time, the orbits should diverge. Even if they had a common origin, they can diverge quite significantly. The comet of 1844 has a predicted orbit on JPL that has uh, 5 degrees more inclination now. It's 50 degrees inclination versus this, this comet's 45. When in 1844, that comet started off with an inclination of 45 degrees. So it will evolve. That orbit will evolve over time. And so would this comet if it had survived. It would have gained a couple of degrees of inclination at least, but not necessarily as much as the, the Great Comet of 1844. So they, they would start to look quite different pretty quickly, um, from what I can tell. So that means they probably were pieces of a singular object, maybe as soon as one orbit before that, you know, thousands of years in the past. This comet has a long period orbit that's, you know, five, 6,000 years long, but you go back even one orbit, perhaps they were a singular object that fragmented when it came through that time and produced the Comet of 1844 and this comet, maybe even one before that. I think there was some uh, analysis they were doing even back in the 19th century trying to compare that comet to one from the 16th century. So that means this could be this fragment's first trip into the inner solar system, which answers the question, why is it disintegrating now? Why not on one of its previous orbits? It might not have had a previous orbit. That is to say, it might have been part of a larger object, and it came off, and now it's experiencing uh, the sun for the first time on its own. It's experiencing this trip into the inner solar system for the first time as its own object, and it's not surviving the trip, because it's just not a big enough fragment. Trying to reload the chat here. How's the stream quality, guys? Are you having buffering issues? My phone is buffering like crazy trying to get the chat loaded. Um, but that could just be something going on with my phone, I don't know. All right, hang on. I'm going to mute I'm going to mute the music for 1 second so I don't get an echo. okay on the computer. <laughs> well, there's no core going to my to my phone, so it's just the Wi-Fi, but the the computer is physically plugged in this time. I, I did check and made sure that it was plugged in all the way, and it is on the Ethernet connection, so should be fine on that. However, I will point out uh, something funny happened uh, last night after I tore down. As soon as I got everything inside, the Internet went down. My internet went completely down and did not come back until after I woke up the next morning. So it was uh, it was good I wrapped up when I did because I'm not kidding. It, it must have been no more than five minutes later the internet was gone. Good morning from Hong Kong. Well, 
Welcome to the stream, Hong Kong. Hope you enjoy it. And Jensen's in Hawaii. Wow, we got people from all over the world here tonight watching. That's cool. Oh, here comes a plane flying over. It kind of came from the direction the telescope's pointing. I wonder if uh, we would get lucky on this shot and get a, a plane flying through. It's a low pass. We got a. got a flight path a flight path that goes right over my house so that's not uncommon with all that flying off is there an ETA when it goes kaput well it's in the process of going kaput it seems um, it could take a few days before it really starts to uh, get lost in the sky glow assuming it doesn't brighten back up at all I mean, there is an outside chance that there's a fragment in there that's still intact enough and has not uh, some residual volatiles, maybe some water ice that would start outgassing as it gets closer to the sun. It's still a little bit further from the sun than Earth is, but, you know, it should be hitting, hitting that point pretty soon where it would uh, start sublimating off any water ice, but... You know, if it's if it's just disintegrated to small fragments at this point, then you're really not going to see much. Hmm. Okay, I don't see any sign of the airplane on the image. Nope, nothing there. I mean, we are looking at a very tiny part of the sky here. Even the full moon would not fit in this view. Yes, and the telescope is following the stars, not the comet itself. The comet is allowed to streak through the view. Um, I'm tracking at a very high rate this uh, guide star right here. But the comet is only moving a little bit in each frame. It's not like it's uh, completely motion blurred. I mean, there's a, some motion blur there, but it's not. Uh, it's not like a huge amount. If it disintegrates, will it still continue in its orbit? Yes, although, due to the increased outgassing and the smaller mass of the fragments in that last bit, uh, it experiences more non-gravitational acceleration. Also, because its uh, fragments are lower in mass, they're affected more by solar radiation pressure and solar wind. And so, you see what they call non-gravitational forces acting on the comet's remains, and it starts to deviate from the expected orbit to a greater extent. That's already started, that's already happened, uh, and it will continue. Um, however, we're not talking about the kind of deviation that could lead to it hitting Earth or posing any kind of danger to Earth. Uh, these deviations are pretty small. You need a telescope to, to notice them. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I haven't done the analysis yet. I haven't gone to that extent yet, but it'll be interesting to see uh, to what extent I can detect those deviations from my own observations of the comet, comparing my previous observations prior to the disintegration to, to uh, tonight and last night, and see where my orbit predicted it would be versus where it actually is in the image. I haven't actually done that analysis yet. Oh, thanks, Scott Mayer. Appreciate the support. Would be neat to use the orbital data of the comet to follow it. Um... I could do that. I have a program I, writ I wrote to do that, but the problem is the telescope's motors are not as accurate as this autoguider, and particularly the adaptive optics unit. We're using adaptive optics here. We're compensating for some of the effects of the atmosphere and all of the uh, guiding air of the motors themselves. This is an LX200 Classic mount, an 8-inch schmidt cassegrain telescope with a pretty long focal length, 2 meters, so it's pretty f unforgiving of tracking air, and so the motors are not perfect. And if I track based on the orbit, 
it's a little bit coarse, and so it'll shake back and forth a bit. Um, and it will actually not be as sharp as it is right now. It would be less sharp, significantly so, especially at this focal length. If I had a wide field refractor, I might be able to get away with it because you're, you're looking with less magnification. But I have noticed that in pictures taken with a wider field of view, um, the comet doesn't appear to be as disrupted. You can't notice the diffuse nature of the nucleus as easily. If you zoom way out on this, imagine this dis diffuse area becomes a point of light again, and it's hard to tell that it's actually uh, undergoing a change. So I've seen at least one person uploaded a photo to spaceweather.com, and in their photo, the comet still looked healthy and, and relatively normal last night. But there's a noticeable change at this focal length looking with the full two meters uh, focal length of the telescope compared to previous webcasts. So again, I'm leaving everything apples to apples. Same exposure time, tracking the same way on the stars, and comparing you know the past two nights to previous nights, it is noticeably dimmer and more diffuse. And you can't blame it on the moon tonight. I mean, the moon is coming up, but it's not really a factor yet. Not like it was last night. So this isn't just moonlight washing it out, and it's not just motion blur blurring it out. It is undergoing a change here, and professional observatories have reported this. So, it does look like the comet is on the decline. And Earth will not be going through the tail of the comet. Um, the tail of the comet, as I mentioned in one of my previous videos, uh, is it should be pointed roughly at Mars, at perihelion, but there's not going to be much left of the comet by that time, I don't think. And so it wouldn't matter anyway. But even if the even if the comet were intact and impressive and the tail got really long and went all the way out to Mars, it's not going to devastate the planet Mars. The tail is composed of dust that is very light, very low mass. And so it's easily blown back by the solar wind and solar radiation, radiation pressure. These are lightweight particles that would burn up in the atmosphere of a planet extremely easily and not reach the surface. It's not throwing off... It's not like the tail's composed of these big skyscrapers that are getting blown back by solar radiation pressure. It's not really what's going on there. Um, we're talking small particles. So, it's, it's not like a Hollywood movie. It's not a danger to Mars, even if it were intact. Uh, what is the next, if there is one, cool select celestial object you'll be checking out? Probably focus the rest of this month, if I get more streams in, on uh, 1998 OR2. It's a near-Earth asteroid that'll be passing by Earth later this month. Um, and there's already starting to be some fear-mongering about that asteroid, unfortunately. Um, so I've already started observing it and collecting data that I'll use to solve for the orbit. I did some observations last night, too, and I'm that's why I was debating going after it tonight. Before I wrap up the webcast tonight, I will move on to that object, I believe, and uh, get some time on it. Whiskey Sadie says, I've noticed from frame to frame the comet looks very different. Could space dust, like a cloud in space, be blocking the comet's light? Uh, I don't think anything's blocking the comet's light. I, I see your point, but um, no, there's really not much between us and the comet. Um, it could be, so some of that's going to be camera noise and just the, the fact that the comet is a low signal to noise object at this point. It's very diffuse. The overall brightness is pretty low. All these, uh, all the, the, the rest of this around the comet, that you see how it's kind of got this background light, okay? Um, kind of greenish, bluish, reddish pixels here. That's just the background light level that the camera's picking up. Some of that is thermal noise, although I have it chilled to negative 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and some of that is just sky glow. Uh, and so the brightness of the comet above that background light level is not very high. So if I mouse over the comet, I'm reading RGB values of 147, 109, 62. Somewhere around there. So the brightest band is red and it's around 150. You go around here, around the comet, the brightness levels, like right here, 74, 80, 54. So the comet is only a, about twice 
the background light level. It's not very high above background emission. You go to the star here, oh, this is 255. Now, this is, th this is only looking at an 8-bit portion of the 16-bit image. So we're looking at a portion of the dynamic range here. It's not a completely fair comparison because this is this image that we're viewing is is processed from the original 16-bit raw FITS file. There's no way of natively displaying that full dynamic range um, in real time, but that's what my tone mapping program is for. Bottom line, um, the comet is not that bright at this point relative to the background, so there's going to be some noise and variation that is expected with that. I do wonder if there are fragments in here, like, you know, there's a little bit of a spot there. It, it makes me wonder, it does make me wonder if there's a little bit of uh, rotating fragments present in that coma, but it's probably just me seeing things in the noise. You know, it's easy to see, it's easy to see patterns that aren't there in the static. Um, and so I think most of this is just static. Most of this is just random noise in the very low light level of the comet at this point. So, the weather is not supposed to be as good tomorrow. I know I said that yesterday about today, but it was originally forecasting that by 11, 12 p.m. tonight, it was going to cloud up. So I wasn't looking forward to that. But um, the forecast changed today to be much more favorable throughout the night tonight. But at some point, there is going to be clouds coming in. Uh, I'm probably not going to be able to observe it tomorrow. Uh, I don't know at what point I'll be able to get back on it, but it's entirely possible that by the time I'm able to get clear skies again, the comet will not be bright enough for my telescope to even be able to detect the remnants of it, that is. So that's why I'm getting another night on it here and saying farewell to Comet Atlas. Hey, Cy Strakeling, good to see you. It looks like Elenin when it broke apart. Exactly, I feel the same way. It, it does give me flashbacks of Comet Elenin from 2011. Uh, when that comet disintegrated, it looked almost exactly like this. If you go back and you look at the images just as it was disintegrating, there were amateurs who caught images of it as it broke up, and this is, this is exactly what it looked like. Um, so I think that's the trajectory this comet's on in terms of its brightness and um, its fate. Have I ever gotten any A-pods before? No, I've uh, never achieved an A-pod. Never really tried either, but no, I, I have great respect for anybody who's able to get an A-pod. Astronomy picture of the day, for those who don't know. Are you rotated slightly from yesterday? Yes, quite a bit. I was 45 degrees rotated from where I am tonight. Tonight I am aligned roughly with the equatorial grid, but the image is inverted due to the mirror that's in the adaptive optics unit. Oh, thank you, Joseph. Appreciate it. Where am I located? Florida. If you see the trailer for... Uh, I, I, I don't know uh, what exact location they're saying this fictional comet impacts, but if you see the trailer for the movie Greenland, um, I, I've seen it on YouTube. I don't know. It seems like they're, they're doing some weird viral marketing strategies with it, but... Um, if you can find it, uh, this trailer for this disaster movie, Greenland, depicts a comet hitting Earth. Uh, and it actually fragments first. It, uh, it disintegrates into fragments. And then one of the fragments hits Earth. Now, that doesn't mean that's what's going to happen here. I, I can guarantee you it's not what's going to happen here. This comet's minimum orbit intersect distance is way too high for that. Um, but in the fictional movie, they show a fragment hitting Earth, and the first fragment hits Florida. In fact, it looks like it lands right on my house. It's hilarious. <laughs> I was looking at that trail, like, yeah, that's about where I live, right there. Yep, <laughs> they show my house getting hit with a comet. <laughs> how fitting is that? So I guess I, I guess I have to see the movie now just to, to see what they, how they depict Florida being destroyed. <laughs> I don't know. But um, there you go. Weirdest thing you've ever zoomed in on or caught with my telescope streams? Well, one time I caught what I believe was some balloons uh, floating in front of the sun during a partial solar eclipse a few years ago, and it caught me by totally by surprise. Uh, and I didn't know what it was at first. It was weird. It looked like it was morphing shape and flying across the sun. Nobody else watching that eclipse saw that, so that tells me it was local to me, and there was an island. I was looking over uh, a bay, 
and on the other side of that bay was an island, and they were probably having a party. There's a bunch of restaurants and upper class uh, uh, clubs there, and like that, somebody was having a private party and let off some helium balloons, and it flew through my telescope's field of view in front of the sun, and uh, produced a UFO on a live stream. A little embarrassing, but I wasn't expecting it in my defense. So here again in this frame, you know, there's a pretty long streak here. Now, as I said, a few pixels will be from motion of the comet. But this extends from 763,324 to... about 742,321. So, 763 to 742. Yeah, again, that's about the same as I measured before, about 20 pixels. And only a, it should only be streaking from motion, from the motion of the comet, by about 4 pixels. Maybe 5, but, you know, 5 to 6 times more elongation is present in this image than would be expected just based on the comet's orbital motion in a two-minute exposure. So there is almost certainly, like, that is clearly an elongated nucleus to me. This is probably the disintegrating material of the nucleus spreading out along the orbit. That's what's going to happen. It's going to spread out along the orbit um, because the heavier chunks are not going to be as influenced by the solar radiation pressure and solar wind, at least not as much as the tail. It's not like it's going to blow way back on like the tail does. It's not just tiny, tiny particles of dust. You know, there's going to be pebbles-sized stuff and chunks, you know, rocks. That, yes, they individually, they have much less mass than the original nucleus. So they will experience more perturbation from non-gravitational forces, solar wind, solar radiation pressure, than the intact nucleus would have experienced. But um, they will generally spread out along the orbit. Gosh, the moths really like my computer monitor tonight. And in this frame, it's not as clear. And I, I see what you're saying, Whiskey Sadie, about it you know, varying from frame to frame. There is a lot of variation there from frame to frame. Um, and it's hard to say, you know, with a telescope this size, exactly what's going on there. How much of that is just due to noise in the camera, and how much of that is due to actual temporal changes. Um, you know, maybe maybe there is a fairly high cadence change in the dust production of the rem of the remnants of this comet. You know, and. Uh, Sometimes you can see it clearer than other times. I don't know. Just a thought I had. <laughs> that would be an interesting uh, marketing strategy there, Sam. Use use the user's location data to pick a clip to play. So they have like a thousand different versions of the trailer. You know, one one for every region in America, and they they show your region being destroyed. That would be a clever marketing strategy. No, the trailer shows Florida being blown up. No, the trailer shows Nebraska being blown up. Everyone sees a different version of it. Leads to mass confusion. Do I do calibration frames? Yes. Um, I don't do the the best calibration process that I should do, but I, I do a single dark frame because it works better with CCD soft for doing live streams. For, for, so for you guys, all for you guys, uh, instead of using a library of dark frames like I ought to do, I just do auto dark, single uh, dark frame subtraction. I know, I know, it's painful. If, if you know how to do deep sky photography properly, that's like a major faux pas. But um, it's for the it's for the stream. It's for the live stream that I do that. And then I do take flat field uh, frames. I took some fresh flat fields last night using my garage door. And um, that worked extremely well, actually. It, it did a very nice calibration on the flats, so I'm going to reuse those tonight, I think. If this would have happened on May 30th, we would have saw a great tail. Yeah. It couldn't hang in there, though, it seems. So, by my estimates, what are the possibilities of it hitting a gas pocket and surviving, and from what angle could we see the ejection? Not sure what you mean by oh you mean like uh, more outgassing being produced by a pocket of material inside the remnants. 
Um, well, if that were to happen, it, it would hopefully resume cometary-like activity, which is going to be dictated by solar wind, solar radiation pressure forming the tail by um, pushing it back away from the sun. The tail, the rule of thumb is the tail of the comet always points away from the sun. So that would be where you'd see a new tail forming, and you would see a new coma forming around the nucleus, whatever remains. But I don't think we're too likely to see that kind of reignition of activity. Um, that's probably the less likely scenario in this case. It's not impossible, but it's not, I think, as likely as an Elenin-like uh, situation where it just gradually fades and uh, goes away. Sorry, a moth is really determined to get my laptop screen, and he's buzzing right near the microphone. Go away. Have I streamed or planned to stream Starlink if possible? I have done a stream on Starlink. The first attempt didn't work so well, but the second attempt I did actually catch some of the some of the satellites on stream, and I've recorded video of it before. I actually haven't done anything with the video I've recorded of it, because I'm not entirely happy with it. I want a high-definition video, and all I have is low def and just standard-definition video of uh, the Starlink satellites at the moment. Um, so, we'll see. I still contemplating the best way to approach that because my SLR camera, yeah, it can get still frame shots of the streaks of the Starlink satellites. That's not hard to do. But I, I want, like, you know, real-time high-def video. And I don't honestly have a great way of doing that at the moment. And here you thought 2020 would have at least one good event happen. Well, like I said, I want to be positive about it and appreciate the comment for what it was and what it provided during my previous streams. Um, I want to thank all of you for the super chats you've given me over these previous streams on this comment. Um, you guys really helped me out uh, between the super chats and the ad money that I've earned from the streams on this comment. I was able to pay for the replacement hand controller for my telescope. So the 3D printed hand controller that I now use with my LX200 Classic uh, that I bought from Clearline, Techno uh, Clearline Technology, you guys paid for that, so thank you. You keep the scope running. It's an old scope. I've had it for 16 years now, and you know parts do fail on it, and the hand controller I had before was in pretty rough shape. And I did have some good advice on how I could, you know, renovate it myself and clean it up, but still, it, the buttons are pretty darn worn down, and I'm, I'm not sure if just cleaning those contacts would have completely solved the problem. Uh, it was not making good contact. That, uh, that much was clear. And the plastic on it's, you know, dried out and cracking, and just, it's in tough shape. But, uh, thanks to the funding from this channel, provided by these streams, I was able to... Uh, pick up that replacement hand controller from Clearline Tech. So, very cool, and I'm quite happy about that, because it's like I've got a whole new telescope there with that uh, new hand controller and such. Just from streaming this comment, pretty much, I mean, my ad money, my AdSense revenue was sitting there pretty low. The account was kind of empty there for a long time, and then in the past month, um, since I started streaming this comet, I got a lot more views, a lot more ad money, some super chats, and it all added up till the point where Google cut me a check. So that check helped pay for the hand controller. Not quite completely, but close enough. I mean, it really uh, defrayed that cost quite nicely. I should I should take a a, a print of the comet from one of the one of the streams and make a sticker out of it and stick it to the back of the hand controller as a reminder of how that came about. <laughs> it's also fitting because I didn't know about that company, Clearline Tech. I didn't know about them uh, until My Carolina Skies came in here on one of these live chats and uh, and recommended them to me. So it was one of you guys who recommended that as a company to get a replacement part. Because I was, I was hurting um, for a new hand controller and it's they're tough to find on the used market sometimes. Uh, and quite expensive as well.
yeah, a little sticker of the comet would be uh, very fitting. So, let's see, we're on image 22. I'm going to get at least 30 images of the comet. That will have been an hour on the comet, which is what I plan to do. Got a bit of a late start here, but we're going to collect an hour's worth of light on the comet. And then I'll move on and get a few images of the asteroid 1998 OR2. And then we'll wrap it up for tonight. So, uh, we've got... Uh, we've got another seven images after this one to go. That's about 14 minutes. It's another quarter of an hour of uh, streaming on this comet here. Yeah, I, I agree, Jensen. I will follow that asteroid closely. Um, so even once this comet's done, even if next time I come back to look for it, I can't find it because it's too faint and it's faded out, that's fine. We'll just move on to the asteroid, and uh, I'll track that if, if at all possible. I haven't really looked at the long-term trajectory of that in terms of just where it's going to be in the sky and how it's going to affect my ability to view it. It's pretty far in the north, which is good because that means it's up for a decent amount of time. Oh, and $20 Super Chat from Robert Rabao. Rabao? Uh, enjoying the stream. Thanks. My pleasure. And I apologize if I butchered your last name. I have not seen Galactic Hunter YouTube channel. Are they good? I'll uh, go give them a subscription. Oh boy. Oh boy, they, they hit the third rail, didn't they? Well, I don't know. That's a popular topic, I guess. Man, they got a ton of views on that video. A review of the uh, Stalina, the future of astrophotography? Hmm, I really am curious to see what they say about that. I, just from surface of looking at the specs on that, I am skeptical. But. I'm open to the evidence, so I'm really curious to see what their review says of that uh, desktop telescope. It's one of these, uh, you know, supposed to be very simple to use. Even a beginner could take deep space photos with it type of thing. Um, but I am skeptical because, well, I mean, the mount doesn't look super steady there. I mean, it's like a little tabletop tripod. But I guess, you know, depending on focal length, maybe you can make that work. I don't know. So I'll, I'll definitely check that out. I'm really curious to see what they have to say. Somebody who looks like they have good equipment and experience using it, I'm really curious to see what they say about that. I know uh, Thunderfoot, I've watched his video on some of these, like the Un uh, Unistellar Scope, I think is the name of it. And he's, he's really been knocking that one pretty hard. Um... And uh, it leads to some vigorous debates, and I'm not sure I want to wade into those waters necessarily. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, there are entrenched interests, I think, on all sides there. People who have bought into some of these technologies and paid good money for it. Uh, some of these scopes are quite expensive. Uh, and others who have traditional astrophotography, uh, astrophotography equipment like, like what I have, which isn't cheap equipment either. Um, and so you kind of have a warring sides of people who have, um, I won't say buyer's remorse, but you know, when, you, when you're personally financially invested in, in hardware like that, you, you kind of develop loyalty to it. And so I don't personally want to impose my biases on a new technology or a new way of trying to do things with astrophotography, but I do see pitfalls in what some of these small automatic scopes are doing and trying to do um, but you know there's a lot of appeal to it because it, it advertises itself as beginner friendly you don't have to you know have experience with telescopes or astrophotography to get started with it at least that's how it's advertised so I do see the appeal um, but I also see the, pot the potential for pitfalls he was loaned a $6,000 software disk mount. Ooh, interesting. For six months. Huh. 
Man, I bet he had some fun with that. Why do people watch this if it's not going to hit us? Well, some of us just like watching comets anyway. Um, doesn't have to be the end of the world or you know a potential danger to Earth to be to be interesting and fun to watch. Uh, this is a astronomy live. This is all about live viewing of various objects. Most of the time, we're looking at uh, deep sky objects that aren't even moving, and just trying to take pictures of them, various galaxies and nebulae. Oh, thank you, Gerard. Very shiny red. Yeah, those paramounts are... I assume it's a paramount. Uh, I believe that's who makes it software bisque, right? Uh, they're really nice uh, mounts. Yeah, mosquito bit me right on my hand. Got me good. I've put on bug spray and everything. Eesh. We're getting into... Getting into warmer weather here in Florida, so the mosquitoes are really going to start coming out of the woodwork. But, uh, yeah, if I didn't have, you know, significant trees all over the place, I would love to be the recipient of a $6,000 mount. However, you know, tough thing is, at the end of six months, I guess he had to turn it in. That's, that's a tough one to have to <laughs> hand over. All right, I'm going to go uh, grab a glass of water, and I'll, I'll be back shortly. I'll keep an eye on the chat, though.
All right, I'm back, and been reading the chat and also reading uh, reading up Comets ML. Someone recommended that as there's some discussion as to whether it's really disintegrating this comet or just underperforming. Uh, some interesting discussion there. There does seem to be some divided opinion on that as to whether the comet is just dimming and underperforming or is it really disintegrating. Hard to say. Uh, I have seen more than one astronomical t telegram suggesting it is actually disintegrating. Two meter telescope took pictures. Um, I forget the name of it. I forget which observatory it was, but a two meter scope was taking images and suggesting a bimodal distribution there, uh, suggesting fragmentation. And the nucleus, such that it is, is definitely elongating. Um, but not everyone agrees. Some people think it is just underperforming and diffuse. We'll see. Others do suggest that the that there is more than just the diffuse and dimming nature of it to go off of, though. There's also increasing residuals in the position from the predicted position due to possibly stronger non-gravitational forces as it fragments. And as those smaller chunks are more susceptible to non-gravitational forces, including out the remaining outgassing and solar wind, solar radiation pressure. So we've discussed all that, but yeah, there is another school of thought that says that the residual fragments are showing um, residuals from uh, relative to the predicted orbital elements, the predicted position from the orbital elements in uh, right ascension as the rubble moves uh, down the tail <laughs> essentially um, in response to those non-gravitational forces and I think that is the most I personally feel that's the most likely situation we're dealing with just a general disintegration and fragmentation of the nucleus not that there's easy to see distinct nuclei but that it is turning into a rubble pile, just a rubble debris field. And there might be some residual dust and outgassing, but not nearly what it was. But the question, I guess, the real question on everyone's minds is whether it can mount a return and exhibit greater life later on. We'll see. Time will tell. I'll certainly keep watching it if I can, when I can, when the weather allows. See, we had a lively one in the chat. Thanks for handling that, Sam. So, anyway, see there was a little bit of uh, <laughs> activity while I was gone. Alright, so I'm going to call it for the comet for tonight. So that will be the last image of the comet for tonight. We will swing over now to asteroid 1998-OR2 and take some quick images of that before I wrap up the webcast tonight. So first we'll go refocus on the bright star Pollux, and then we will move on to the asteroid.
see if we've got Pollux in view. We're going to be taking pictures of 1998 OR2, reset the starting number 0. We won't save these initial focus images. We will take a quick picture here, verify we're pointing in the right direction. And there it is. Okay, there's Pollux. Okay. So now we're going to take a little sub picture, zoomed in on Pollux, get a better idea of the focus. Okay, it needs a little bit of tweak. tweaking it the wrong direction again. I always do that. Yeah. So this is the star Pollux, and I've got the Batonov focusing mask on the telescope. I'm trying to get the uh, that horizontal diffraction spike going through the middle of the X diffraction spike to be symmetrical. This is how you uh, verify focus and get perfect focus. That looks pretty good. Yeah, that looks good there. I'm going to call that well enough. Oh, wait. I don't know. It might have shifted. No, okay, it's just a, just a little atmosphere. Okay, that looks good there. Let's go chase down the asteroid. Alright. Hey, Slick X, you just missed the comet. We're going after 1998 OR2 now. Oh, we don't want subframe. What am I doing? Okay, let's do... Okay, cool. There's our auto-guide star for the asteroid. So we want that to also be at the bottom of the auto guider frame. And the asteroid's basically directly under it. So let's keep it centered in the frame. Uh, 
uh, the fragments of the comet are not coming close to Earth. The close approach distance of the comet and its fragments is no better than about three quarters of the dis distance to the Sun. And the minimum orbit intersect distance is more than half the distance to the Sun, over 0.6 AU. So no, there's no threat to Earth no matter what happens with that comet, no matter how badly it fragments. Did it break up? We think so. It still looks like it's uh, a, basically a dead comet at this point, or dying anyway, in the process of dying. Um, there's really not a strong, condensed nucleus. It's very diffuse and faint. So it's quite, no quite a noticeable change to my telescope anyway. There's some debate as to whether it's simply underperforming or is it actually dying. We will see. Time will tell. But I think it is, my personal opinion is it's in the process of dying. Okay, we're on the auto guide star. Go ahead and turn on auto save. Now we're going to take images of 1998 OR2, which will be making a close approach to Earth shortly. Uh, because I annoy people when I do long exposures that streak a moving object like the asteroids, so we will do one minute exposures instead. So this is an asteroid. A meteor is a rock from space that's burning up in the atmosphere. And a meteorite is a rock from space that's already hit the ground. An asteroid is still in space. A meteoroid, so you can get into the minutia of the terms. Meteoroids are small, like miniature asteroids, right? Little rocks in space that are going to hit the atmosphere but um, haven't hit yet. All right, so now it's going to take the auto dark. Let me see if I can figure out where we're at here. Okay. Where is the asteroid? I think, gosh, it's hard to say, but I think it might be here. It kind of does look like it's moving. It looks like it might have streaked a little bit in the minute-long exposure I took. I guess we'll see shortly enough if it's moving.
Here we go. Here comes the next image of the asteroid. Yes, that's it. You can see it moving right there. So this is asteroid 1998 OR2. So this asteroid will be approaching uh, Earth at a distance of 16.4 times this distance to the moon on April 29th, according to spaceweather.com. Current distance is uh, 0 0.10, uh, sorry, 0 0.107 astronomical units. Uh, the light we're seeing from the, this asteroid is delayed by um, 0.89 minutes, almost a full minute. And uh, current distance in kilometers, 16 million, 16 million kilometers. It's moving along, pretty good rate. It doesn't have a tail, it's just slightly motion blurred from the minute long exposures I'm doing. Yeah, it's a big one. Uh, Spaceweather.com lists it as being 2,457 meters long, or in diameter. Um, so over two kilometers in size. Would not want that to hit Earth, for sure. Alright, so we'll collect some more astrometry on this for a few more minutes, and then I'll be wrapping up the stream once this is over. But until then, enjoy Asteroid 1998 OR2.
Alright, so... I'm going to be wrapping up the webcast here. We'll take one more... picture, I guess. Of uh, the asteroid here. But uh, while it takes that picture, I just want to thank everyone for coming out. Thank you for all of your support. I'm going to take a quick look at the forecast here just to see what awaits me tomorrow. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cloudy, and then Friday's just solid. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're going to get... We're going to get slammed starting tomorrow and into Friday. What's the weather forecast for the weekend? Yeah, it's going to get cloudy and then eventually rainy into next week sometime, probably. So that might end up being... This might end up being the last I see of the comet, unless there are residual pieces that are still emitting gas and dust and able to uh, continue producing some cometary t activity. So, you know, there's an outside chance that maybe it'll just massively underperform expectations without uh, completely disintegrating, but I'm not going to hold my breath for that, which is why I came out here again for the second night in a row to uh, try to catch what I could of whatever's left of Comet Atlas. And again, I just want to thank everyone for their support and coming out and seeing uh, the stream. And I'll continue tracking, at the very least, continue tracking uh, Asteroid 1998 OR2 as it approaches Earth throughout the month. And uh, eventually do a video publishing my astrometry of its position and the orbital elements that I calculate, along with a, a program very similar to the Comet astrometry program I uh, released this weekend. I'll be doing a version for asteroids here and uh, planning to try to do that video this weekend. So stay tuned for that. And until next time, clear skies, folks.